On this episode of True North, we head into the Arctic wilderness. Oh my god. <laughs> the tracks are less than a day old. Hello. It's a big one. It's like half the glacier. During the night, we'll be doing polar bear watches. The polar bears here can come from every direction. Your eyes play tricks on you or something. I don't think I'm going to be forgetting about this night anytime soon. Everything about this place is built on adventure. So for our last Arctic experience, we were setting out on an adventure of our own. We wanted to get up close and personal with Svalbard's vast wilderness and see one of the glaciers that characterized its rapidly changing landscape firsthand. So we arranged for two wilderness guides to take us on our own polar expedition. My name is Harry. I work for Spitsbergen Express as a captain and a guide. My favorite part of uh, Arctic is uh, working with the nature. I'm a nature boy. With how fast this place was changing, we didn't want to miss an opportunity to take it all in. My name is Magnus. The Svalbard nature is very dramatic. You have the high, unique mountains and the glaciers and, uh, of course, all the wildlife. And hopefully we get to see some different seabirds, maybe some seals, some walrus, some whale, and, of course, the king of the Arctic, the polar bear. And while we were excited to see more nature, I was nervous about one part of nature in particular. Bears are so much scarier than demons or dinosaurs because they're real. Bears okay. don't give a f I did a lot of research into bear attacks and they are horrendous. I don't when know if I've ever seen a bear. Time you were in the wild. I'm supposed to take a trip later on this year, but it puts me bear adjacent and they do kill people. I've looked it up. You are insane. <laughs> like your fear of bears is unbearable. Right ahead of us now, behind all this white stuff, there's a beautiful, massive glacier front. The S. Mike Glacier. Ah, uh, I think we can see some ice. <laughs> it makes it a bit more dramatic even when it suddenly shows up out of the fog. Svalbard's glaciers have been retreating since the 1920s, but the rate of retreat has more than doubled since 2000, from an average of 1.6 kilometers per year to 3 kilometers per year. I think we'll try to make our campsite in this area. A seal. There's a seal right in front of us. That's a good sign. I'm trying to remember what eats those. <sighs> There's a seal out there. Oh, okay. We've been looking for seals the whole time. What? The yeah. second to last thing I wanted to see. After the obvious. So, um, highly recommend that we eat first. Yeah. Eat, pack up. Pack up, out. Salud. Yeah. You had a polar bear now a week ago that was sort of known for breaking into cabins. He was going through our garbage a couple of times. Oh, really? He only took the things with tomato sauce or ketchup. Because you have these dry tech, the expedition uh, food. All the ones with pasta bolognese, he had ripped open and licked the inside completely clean. There also used to be a polar bear called the Bailey's bear. Pretty much left everything untouched apart from the Bailey's That's bottles. That's hilarious. <laughs> but there was uh, one polar bear two, three years ago in, in Pyramiden, inside of the hotel. In the in, hotel. in the restaurant. Yeah. No, we were in that hotel, in that restaurant. Magnus was just telling us stories about a friendly and curious polar bears he had met that summer. But I can tell that it just put the fear of God in John. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. So uh, you can pick up which uh, taste you like. Cool. Polar bears, it's an amazing animal, and they are really clever. Curiosity of the animal is also how it survives in the Arctic. Do this. It learns really quickly the things it should do. Thank you. And that's why it's really important also that they don't learn that humans mean food. So that's why we have to scare them away. That deserves the 
the adjective breathtaking that glacier. This is hardcore. Spots. Okay. Don't find the bowler bridge tracks here. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, well, that's the other cool. shore. I mean, the tracks are right there, but our tent's gonna be all the way over here. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> probably won't notice. It's five cool. meters. When I went out with the dinghy, there was so much seals laying on the ice floors in the glacier front. That's why I think that the bowler bridge was somewhere nearby. I wonder where the seals have gone. The seal. seals are like, let the polar bears eat them, then we come yeah. back. I wonder if we'll ever get on that boat again. <sighs> I would feel much more comfortable if I had a weapon. If I had a weapon, you guys should feel less comfortable, but I would feel more comfortable. Like, how fresh is that? My theory is that he says this is a low tide, and you can see the line of the vegetation that will be at like the terminus of the high tide, which is right past the tracks, which means the tracks are less than a day old. It's your theory. That's my theory. Okay. It's not like there's a lot of footfall here though, so they really could be. And it's been summery, so. I'm theorizing that we're not gonna die imminently. Uh, delusional. That is quite the soundtrack. You're gonna hear a lot of that. Wow. Big one. It was like half the glacier. Look at this mist coming on. Wow, you really can't see far. Oh yeah, the fog has come in. Cool. Looks very good. Yeah. Have you been inside yet? No. Nope. You need to check out your new home. Gotta get there fast. John's trying to inflate my like under mattress thing. It's very slow going. Okay, this is painful to watch. <laughs> I don't really understand how this works. But you're doing it. How's it going with this one? Slowly? Slowly. <laughs> What's the, is there a you technique? You need to do sort of a rolling motion. Oh, I see. One of the main goals of civilization is to get to a point where you're not easily reached by predators and then we offer ourselves up to them again. Man, is so foolhardy. That's terrifying. I can't see anything. A polar bear coming out of the water there can cover this distance in like two and a half seconds. Yeah. Oh my god. Oh my god. So during the night we'll be doing polar bear watches. So I'll stay up to a certain point and then you guys have to do the rest of them through the night. And the easiest way to do it is two hour shifts. The polar bears here can come from every direction. You can walk along the coast up to the camp here. It can come swimming from the ocean uh, in all directions. And it can come down from the mountainside here if it's crossing from another area. So basically 360 degrees around the camp, you need to keep watch. And uh, of course, don't fall asleep. You'll not be carrying a rifle or anything like that. Uh, but I'll be sleeping outside, so as soon as you see anything, or if you see anything, just wake me up and uh, I'll be out of my sleeping bag in about three seconds and uh, can see what, what it is. Are polar bears drawn to light? No, not really. Polar bears are drawn to whatever sort of catches their interests. If there are some funny smells, uh, anything sort of out of place in nature, like a tent camp for example, uh, might often trigger uh, some polar bears attention and they will come and investigate. Almost all polar bears are very easy to scare off. <laughs> the crunchy underfoot, is that honestly what you're for or just scanning the horizon? No, just scanning the horizon for anything moving basically. Yeah. Uh, the polar bear is not completely white. Most polar bears would be quite dirty because of all the mud and also if it's been able to catch a seal or something like that it's also covered with blood uh, usually. But just anything moving and uh, let me know. Yeah. Okay. It's the ocean watching that is going to freak me out. I know it. I can't remember the last time I had to keep myself awake and occupied with nothing for two straight hours. Oh yeah. 
Look at that. Oh God, why is he doing that? Well, I mean, there's something in the ocean, a black thing. Did you see that actually? Yeah. Is it a bird or a seal? Hey Magnus, I think there's something small in the water. Yeah, there's definitely, it's like a seal maybe. You can see you it? see it? Yeah, I can definitely see it. It's cutting across. It's now it's going back to the right. Yeah. Oh, I saw something reflect. Yeah, it reflected. I'm using the searchlight because I want to see her surroundings on the camp so that uh, there is no approaching polar bears in the area. Probably just a seal, yeah. Yeah. But uh, very nice spotted. He was pointing at it with the light. That's the sort of things you'll be looking for in the water. Yeah. Things that look like that. I'm sorry about how many times we're going to wake you up for a seal. <laughs> I decided to go for the beef option. <laughs> like a real caveman. That smells pretty good. Yeah, right? I draw a polar bear in from miles away. Oh, God. Hmm. Oh, it feels warm though. <laughs> So I'm like, mm, my baby. <laughs> Man, just drops off the black, like so close. Wait, it says nutrients per 100 grams, and then it says 469 kilocalories, but this is 500 grams. So what, it's like 2,000 calories? No, that can't be right. It's, uh, it's a lot. What? <laughs> Put on the Svalbard 15 eating what? out here. At least I'll be nice and fat for the polar bear. Oh, wow. Oh. What do you think it is? It be a small seal. What an appetizing sign. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else's dinner. Sleep well. So this is what we'll be doing all through the night to make sure nothing sneaks up on us. The polar bear danger in Svalbard is something that needs to be taken seriously. In certain areas, such as the area where we're at now, it's more likely uh, that you would have a polar bear for several reasons. One is that we're camped now quite close to the shoreline. The polar bear is a marine mammal. Now during the summer, what the polar bear is usually doing is that they're patrolling up and down the coast. And also here we are a couple of hundred meters away from this big glacier, which is calving quite a lot. That means you have a lot of drift ice in the fjord here, which the seal use to rest. The polar bear is completely dependent on sea ice to be able to hunt. So this is a quite an exposed area for polar bears. You can't really see anything. It's too dark. Even with the flashlight, you can't really see much. So you start listening and trying to figure out what a polar bear would sound like if it was approaching on land or through the water. It sounds like that. It sounds like that wave and every other wave. When you're pretty much alone in the dark, everything looks like the thing you're looking for and everything sounds like it. So the thing that I keep thinking about is around that bend over there, where the tracks came from, how long would it take a polar bear walking at its normal speed to go from not visible to in our camp? You can't see it without the flashlight, but you can't have the flashlight on all the time. And so you do it every couple of minutes, but what if you turned off the flashlight just as it rounded the bend? You don't want to be the one that's responsible for a polar bear walking right into the camp. watch. I was looking far down the beach and the light caught an eye and it started to move onto the land. You could tell that it was coming towards us. I suspected that it was too small to be a polar bear but I thought maybe I'd seen a cub and so I woke up Magnus and it turned out it was an arctic fox. So that was terrifying at first. It wasn't a polar bear but a random creature did walk down this beach into our camp. And go away fox! Go away! Foxes are supposed to be scared of humans. It's weird to think about the people like Magnus that will do like long extended trips. I mean the explorers who stayed out for years. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be forgetting about this night anytime soon.
Oh my god. <laughs> well, like I'm pretty sure the little heads and the little slithering are seals, but am I in my element? Do I feel comfortable? No, I do not. Oh, what was that? Do you see it moving? It's definitely moving now, quite quickly. <laughs> Your eyes play tricks on you and it gets so cold. Hi, I'm about halfway through my watch. It's starting to get light. It's actually getting kind of pretty. When I was doing my last um, scan with the flashlight, I had just turned it on and was like scanning the water, which freaks me out the most. And then just this, these two glowing eyes, like this thing just started running towards me and then I got into my spotlight and it was an adorable Arctic fox. Hey, Foxy. Hey, buddy. I feel bad, like we're not supposed to feed the animals, but <laughs> he's so cute. And then it just kind of came right next to me. It was just kind of milling around. Our guide is sleeping in a sleeping bag out there and his feet were moving and the fox was just kind of jumping on its feet. <laughs> I think he thought he was maybe hunting something under the snow. It was very cute. Ended up being quite comforting. <laughs> My worries about falling asleep or getting distracted were unfounded because I just ended up like pacing like a crazy person. Like it's not just you that you're looking out for, it's uh, everybody else as well. <laughs> When I woke up, I felt great because I had woken up, which was not a foregone conclusion that it would happen at all. And uh, you know, it was nice to be alive. I am glad that we're doing something like this before the end. After last night, I guess the uh, hiking on a glacier should be pretty easy. Yeah. Different kind of challenge. Over the month we spent here, two themes seem to pervade all of our Arctic experiences adventure and change. From the history of the polar explorers to the people we met, embracing the adversity of this place was deeply woven into the culture. The other was change. Changes to the climate, the landscape, the ecosystem. From being here, you got the feeling that you were seeing this place in a state that it hadn't been in and that it might never return to. I can see the difference on the pleasure front. Every year it's getting smaller. That is one thing that we notice as a guide. Here we have some glacier equipment that we need to put on before we head up onto the ice. So you have each your own ice axes. You use them as walking sticks basically when you're on the glacier. And then there's these little packages here, what you need to be rescued if you fall into a crevasse. We'll try to avoid that though. And then also these things, which are called crampons with all these spikes in them so that you stick to the ice when you're walking. A big one. Glaciers cover 60% of Svalbard's landmass. But since its temperatures have been increasing, particularly during the summer, its glaciers have been melting rapidly. In one three month summer period, Svalbard's glaciers lost four and a half million tons of meltwater per hour. Just uh, keep your eyes open for polar bears as well, because we're walking through terrain with bad visibility and a lot of areas where they can hide. Oh, what a fun parting spot. So you can see the river coming out from underneath the glacier. That's all the meltwater from higher up on the glacier plateau, which finds different streams either out to the side or digs channels inside the glacier all the way down to the bottom. The water here is full of sediments and this is also what's creating the whole landscape around here. An unusually high number of Svalbard's glaciers are surging or pulsating glaciers, which means they go through periods of rapid expansion and retreat. And you can see that this glacier is moving quite fast. It's sort of pushing pile this of little dirt, pile yeah. of dirt in front of it. So this glacier is actually stretching further and further out into the fjord because it's in the middle of a surge. The surges are caused by the combined effects of mass like snow and ice accumulating at the top of the glacier and meltwater accumulating between the glacier and the ground. They can advance at a rate of more than 20 meters a day, which is more than 20 times the rate of an average glacier. It's intensely beautiful with the reflection around <laughs> it. Look at that. 
spectacular view. The surface of a surging glacier is jagged, littered with deep crevasses and meltwater channels. Wow, it stretches off really far. They're called nunataks, when they're, it's just the top of the mountain sticking up out of the ice. Out All of that dirt and the farther thing, it looks like there's ice under there too. Yeah, yeah, there is. There's probably ice underneath where we're at now yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. All the dirt that lands on top of the ice works as insulation from the sun. So that means also that you can theoretically have crevasses here where we think it's solid. <laughs> there's always something to think about. Always something trying to kill you. Yeah. No, that's impossible. If you just give me a couple decades, let global warming do its job. It just makes it more dangerous. Walk across it. Yeah, it's a beach. <laughs> all right. With the crampons, your heels are supposed to be all the way at the back, and the front of your foot is supposed to be all the way in the front of these two. Lean on boats, like any of that stuff. This, this is the most dangerous thing we're doing. <laughs> Actuarially. I don't know, over a long enough time span, I think all those Mars bars are. Well, yeah, there's the dangerous. silent killer, which is heart disease. The entrance to the glacier is a bit difficult one, but the easiest one we could find. And uh, as soon as we get up this little hill here, it becomes a lot nicer. The way we'll be walking on the glacier is with a so-called French walking technique. Uh, so these are not climbing crampons and these are not climbing axes, but walking. The most important thing is to try to keep all the spikes on your crampons into the ice all the time. This is not super steep. Uh, so it's possible to walk basically straight up. So take, take slow steps and try and get all the spikes into the ice. The most difficult part is to trust, trust in the crampons that they will hold you. But as long as you do this correctly, your crampons should hold. All right. All right, let's have a go. You really about every step. So just take every step very slowly and start getting used to the crampons. How does it feel? It looks good. There, and then you use these little ledges and cracks in the ice. Yeah, there. The clearer the ice, the better it is. Try and get your foot up there. <laughs> if you grab my hand here. <laughs> there. Yep. Here. Looking good, John. No, no, take it nice and nice and easy. I want to also, like, yeah. Touch the <laughs> yeah, your your hand's not gonna do much if you start slipping. You have nothing to sort of reach after. Over here. Watch out where there's mud. There might be holes and cracks underneath it. As you see, it goes quite uh, quite deep down here. So if you step through areas like this, yeah. you can quite easily injure your legs. And then it can be uh, two meters of uh, crack filled with water uh, underneath it. So you might just bloop, fall in. Yeah. So we'll try to avoid that. So be aware of your footing. When you're walking with crampons, to prevent you tripping over yourself, walk with quite wide feet, like a cowboy. You feel quite stupid, but it doesn't look that bad. You can't always just go walk straight up because your feet only bends so far. As you can see on me, it's quite difficult. But if you walk backwards instead, your feet bends a lot more and you bend your knees and find a good balance. And then it's not that difficult at all to walk backwards up a hill like this. So the safest way is to try and be relatively relaxed and then a bit more sort of assertive. <laughs> all right, so now try to walk up this ridge. Make sure to find your balance with every step. There, about there. Try and keep your toes pointing right down the hill. Yeah. Doesn't feel great. Remembering to use your axe. Very cracky. 
<laughs> come up to hold on to you in case you fall. Yeah. This Just is hard. very slowly yeah. move move sideways to the left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you stand at the top? <laughs> That's <laughs> cheating. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. The really exciting part is the water way at the bottom. This is mess. <laughs> what am I doing? What choices did I make to get here? And then you can try to traverse over here, and there, and then slowly start moving sideways from there. I lost my confidence. Good. No, I got it. I got it. Just make sure to make sure to lean back all the time. Just coming. Sorry. Stopping baby and move. It gets very steep. So now you have to lean back again. Make sure you have a good footing. Baby wise. <laughs> when we're in an area like this and you have this wall here but up in this direction it's perfectly nice and flat the main thing about walking on glaciers is to find a good route so then you wouldn't do this thing you would walk up here instead which is quite easy yeah all right okay thank you i think you're ready to descend to keep heading up keep heading up. into the okay. ice. <laughs> we need to get a bit of a view up there. Oh, that drops off. Straight up murdering this ice. <laughs> <laughs> that was dicey for a second. <laughs> what was that? Why is he shooting? He's trying to shot. That was a flare gun. Why was he trying to radio you, maybe? There might be a polar bear down by the beach. That's what that meant. Can you reach him by radio from here? That's, no, that's cry, we'll cry from up here. Like, climb up this ice. Or there might be a polar bear. Spitsbergen Express. Spitsbergen Express. The Magnus. Of it. I'm gonna poop my pants. I'll run up to the next top and see if I can get in contact with Hari. Maybe just stay there for now. After a night of polar bear guard duty and then a day of hiking and climbing on the glacier, I had assumed that we'd made it past the threat of a polar bear. I'd sort of gotten hopeful. And then the flare gun goes off. How did you... I'm like trying to keep it together. It could have been several kilometers away, but to know that there is probably a polar bear still somewhere around is disconcerting. When you were up on the glacier, I was doing the work by myself on a camp, trying to put it down. My back was all the time on the ridge. And I uh, suddenly just had the gut feeling that there's somebody behind the ridge. I was qu quite positive that it was somewhere there, laying in the moraine. We've got a squadron of polar bears moving in your position. I don't know what is the English word for that, but let's say it was a little bit dodgy. When they switch to Norwegian, you know it's good news. This good. is legit good. one of the scariest things I've done. <laughs> He's up on this little hill looking around, so it's probably Hadi that scared off a polar bear that was approaching. Because, yeah, we don't really want to bump into it as well. No, that's a bit bad if it turns up between us and the boat. Yeah. We don't want that. So hopefully he'll get it away from here. That was not ice. <laughs> made me look so cool. Yeah, thanks for saving me. You're welcome. <laughs> oh wow. It's so blue. I'm not gonna see something like that again. It's kind of mind-blowing how much this glacier changes and is constantly calving and refreezing in strange new ways. And there's new rivers that are emerging and crevices underneath the tiny sheet of ice. 
Glaciers that are surging also lose ice more quickly and at a higher volume than other glaciers, leading to big shifts in the fjord environments. And with an increase in temperatures, the number of surging glaciers are likely to increase. It was certainly a thrill getting up here. I've never done anything like this before. To rely on crampons to keep you on like a 45 degree incline composed entirely of ice, knowing that it will work if you trust it, it's an exciting entry into a world I'd never really had any experience with. Everywhere I look, there's just a breathtaking view. It's an amazing sight. I did many times look around and wonder, what would this have looked like 10 years earlier or 40 years earlier? You know, would there be ice in the water where I'm looking right now? Would the glacier be out farther? Would the mountains be more capped with snow and ice? And so even in the moment, I had to wonder, have I already missed something? And then thinking forward to the future, wondering if we were to come back, would the landscape even be recognizable? I can't imagine what the Arctic is gonna look like in 20 years. I only have this one data point, this one moment in time to go on, but I have this low level dread that too much has already changed and that it's unlikely that we'll stop it. There you go. This Arctic nature is fragile, that's for sure. Arctic itself is going to be here, but which kind of state that we can't tell. The Arctic seems like this very rugged place of mountains and ice and predators that are tough, but the Arctic is actually very delicate for everything living up here, and it's something that we could lose very quickly. The Arctic is not just a place that's visibly changing, but a laboratory for a new understanding of climate change and how it actually proceeds day by day and decade by decade that's incredibly important. It's not hopeless, but for the humans it might be. Of course, we take a lot of animals with us, but the planet is going to be here for a long, long time after us. Climate change is happening in the Arctic. It's happening fast and with force, and at this point a large percentage of it will occur regardless of our best efforts. What did that mean for Svalbard and the future of the Arctic? We went to speak with a group of people asking that same question. My name is Alan. I work for the Greenpeace office in Norway, and I'm uh, the campaign lead for the project on oil drilling here in the Barents Sea. It's very easy to get lost in a ship. <laughs> so this is the bridge. This is where all commands are done. The Arctic oil campaign that Greenpeace has is about stopping oil drilling in the Arctic waters. We're all activists. We're all part of Greenpeace but half of the people on board is working to run the ship. So they make sure the engine goes, they drive the ship, we have a cook that makes the food, and then the other one is campaigners. So we come on when we have different campaigns. So we have comms people, digital people, we have activists, policy people. Greenpeace is the biggest NGO, and I really like our independence. Like we don't receive money from any government or companies, we are really like people power environmental organization. So it's quite of an honor being here. Where in the world has this particular ship been? Well, the Arctic Sunrise is normally operating here in the north because it's an icebreaker and can handle the cold environment. But it's been in the Amazon, Antarctica, Mediterranean, wherever it's needed to do work. Wow. We have seen that when the ice melts, the business opportunities come in the Arctic. The oil industry, the trawling industry, the shipping industries are going north. And we want to make sure that the most pristine areas are safe. The Svalbard Treaty entered into force in 1925, where several countries, including the US, the UK and France, they recognized the sovereignty of Norway over these islands that in legal terms are called Terra Nullius, or no man's land, but in exchange they secured a right of equal access to exercise commercial activities on the islands and in the waters. Almost a hundred years later, areas that were once protected by the thick Arctic sea ice are changing quickly, leaving as much as 40% of the central Arctic Ocean ice-free in the summer, which has been viewed by industries and governments as an economic opportunity. Shipping in the Northeastern Passage is advancing rapidly. 
once a no-go area, now melting ice has made an Arctic shortcut between Asia and the West a reality. In 2009, the first two cargo ships made the voyage with icebreaker accompaniment. In 2012, that number had increased to 46. And in 2017, a Russian tanker made the voyage during the winter without an icebreaker, proving the Northeastern Passage could be viable year-round. Promising a 30% reduction in shipping time from China to Europe and a safer route than the pirate-laden Suez Canal. Estimates have been made that by 2021, 15 million tons of cargo will use this route, along with 10 million tons of oil and 15 million tons of natural gas, leaving the Arctic vulnerable to a myriad of new environmental dangers. Another industry that sees an opportunity in the changing Arctic is the commercial fishing industry. Commercial fish stocks are migrating poleward. The fish fleet will, of course, also follow this commercial fish stock. But when the Ice Age also is removing northward, the fleet can enter new, more pristine areas of the seabed. From 2012 to 2015, hundreds of vessels moved into the previously ice-covered waters, and 90% of those vessels have been trawlers. A bottom trawl would be a big net that is sent out from the ship and then sinks down to the sea floor. This trawl will take whatever is in its path. The trawling industry is moving in and there is corals and wildlife under the seabed that are endangered. This is the Greenpeace boat Arctic Sunrise. Uh, just to keep you informed that we will be coming in a bit closer as we obtain some documentary images. The reason why this can be a problem is that in areas where we have a high diversity of seabed fauna, we will also have an increased number of species. Just think about the coral reefs. When the trawl then hits area of large complexity, the seabed will be flattened. So these will be the areas that we need to protect. We want to stop the expansion of industrial fisheries into areas in the Arctic that have never been fished before. And we're calling on the Norwegian government to create a marine protected area in the waters around Svalbard. In addition to trawling and shipping, Greenpeace is facing off against the most imminent threat to the Arctic environment oil drilling. The oil companies need to look for new frontiers. And they would go for the cheapest and easiest first, and when that runs out, they will start to go into unconventional oil, like tar sands and Arctic oil. The Arctic is challenging for the oil companies, and that's also put the price of producing oil up. They need to develop new technologies, but they see it's worth it because they're running out of oil other places on the planet. The Norwegian government identified what is called vulnerable areas and there was a consensus that there will be no oil drilling along the ice edge. This ice edge has moved further northwards and then the present government said, okay, then we can permit oil drilling further north. Because of climate change, the ice edge is withdrawing and then you can permit more oil drilling that leads to more climate change. So I think it's a bit ironic. We saw the beginnings of what could be seen as an Arctic oil rush. The Norwegian government is looking north to expand the oil industry. They handed out hundreds of new oil licenses to all the big players. There's US companies, BPs, there's Russian, Swedish. Statoil, the Norwegian state-owned oil company, is the first one to drill in the new licenses and is doing that uh, this summer. Arctic is still Arctic, even if the ice is melting. It will be dark in the winter, it will be storms. Then, of course, if there is oil spill, how do you clean it up? Particularly if there is ice there, what happens? Does it degrade? Yeah, you know that from your experiences of Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska waters. And recent attempts to drill in the Arctic have not gone well. The challenge with the oil accident in the Bering Sea is mainly the big distances. So it would take days to get extra personnel and equipment up to clean up the oil. They could only work with what they have on site. 
and in a couple of days the oil could spread into a big area and especially in the winter months where it's freezing cold and dark around the clock it will be basically impossible to clean up an oil spill especially if it comes under the ice I was working in the oil industry for a bunch of years and I was working as an industrial climber, a rope access technician. When I started out, you know, I was super happy for the opportunity because not everybody gets a chance to go offshore and work on oil rigs. But in my spare time as a climber, I do a lot of mountaineering. So it kind of felt wrong working with oil and then going out in nature and appreciating everything that that gives. And the longer I did that, the more you know, I started questioning myself what I was doing was you know, the right thing. And I then got a call from Greenpeace, it was back in 2015, and they asked me if I wanted to go on this trip to confront Arctic oil drilling. So you know, then I had to make a, like, a life choice, if I wanted to stay in my safe little box, make money and you know, live my life, or if I wanted to do something bigger in a way. And, um, I called him back after a few hours and eventually went on the trip. Now we're going back to the helideck. And what is the helicopter mainly used for? We use them for navigating in ice. We also use them in illegal fishing campaign to look for vessels at sea. But in the recent year we use more and more drones instead to keep the climate footprint down as much as we can. And of course it's much cheaper for operations and also for safety. And I see you also have uh, multiple of these rib boats on the deck. Yeah, we use them for all kinds of operations, from actions to science to going on land on remote places. What do those operations look like? Last time we did actions here in Norway it was in 2014. And that was the last time that uh, Norwegian state was up in the Barents Sea with a big drill program. We had an action for five days, where we first had climbers on board to stop the operations. So me and five other activists managed to board their oil rig and protested. Because Statoil registered their oil rig in a tax paradise, the Norwegian police wasn't able to remove the activists. Because it's actually the jurisdiction of a different country. Yeah, it, when the oil rig is moving, it operates like a ship. So it would be the jurisdiction of the country it's registered in. So it took them three days of paperwork to get the permissions to take the activist off. Drilling here in the Arctic outside Norway does not only affect the wildlife and the life up here in the north. It's something that's going to affect the whole world in terms of climate change. But not all of Greenpeace's peaceful protests have gone so smoothly. This ship just came out of a, a six-month refit, where we are making it ready for operation for the next 10-15 years. One of the reasons were that it was detained in Russia in 2013, and was held there for three months. And there was very little care taken for the ship during that detention. Why was it detained in the first place? The Arctic campaign has been protesting Arctic oil since it started and the Russians had several operations. They had the first offshore drilling fixed installation, the Preraslomnia oil rig, that was set up some years ago, and that's the one we were protesting. The plan was to get up onto the side of the oil rig and to halt the production of oil. The activities being carried out in preparation for drilling for oil in the Arctic Ocean represents a real and immediate threat to the environment. We did a very similar action the year before, and had not so many consequences. We call it the Arctic 30 case. The reaction was, for some reason, much bigger. We have started being chased everywhere we tried to get a line up. Uh, I managed to get a rope up and I started to climb up on it. But just when I was attaching myself to the rope, uh, the Coast Guard boat came and, and started pushing our boat away. They had made a decision that was not going to happen and they drew guns and they pointed it straight in my face. I just got this thought in my head that okay, it's getting really dangerous and then I could feel Crusoe shaking and I, I realized that he's getting hypothermia. They wanted me to come down but they didn't realize that when they hold the rope I can't come down. So I was stuck there. 
the FSB agents on board were going much more aggressive. They boarded the ship from a helicopter. They arrested everyone on board and charged them first for piracy and then they charged them for hooliganism. And then they had to sit three months in detention before oh, wow. they came out. And it was a big political case, of course, for all of Greenpeace. Yeah. Do you consider yourself a pirate? No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> it sounds cool, though. But even months in a Russian jail couldn't weaken Greenpeace's resolve to protect the Arctic. Some NGOs have sued the Norwegian government and arguing that the licensing of drilling in this area is illegal, violating the constitution of Norway. The Norwegian constitution was amended a few years ago, and now it says that the politician has a duty to take care of the environment for future generations. And that's what we build a legal case around. Drilling for oil in the Arctic is not compatible with taking care of the environment. So we have been working with allies and we filed a lawsuit on October last year and in a couple of months we'll go to court and present our case. One of the ways we are letting people take part in that case is that we are collecting witness statements. So we're asking people from all over the world to send in like what would you say if you were at the witness stand against Arctic oil and the Norwegian government. And we'll bring it to Oslo to the city court and we'll use it as evidence in the legal case to show but there's lots of people caring and demanding a change. This feels very big. It is very big. We are suing the Norwegian state on climate grounds. We cheered when the Paris Agreement was adopted in December last year. However, in spite of being a rapid signer and ratifier, Norway still continued with its Arctic oil licensing as if nothing had happened. This is a balancing between protection of the environment and also economical and social development. And often the environment is not on the winning side. I have a few messages here from people all around the world that I would like to share with you. With the current knowledge about the damage that's being caused by the environment. Particularly this campaign about the Arctic oil is so close to my heart since it's my government and it's the country where I live. Since filming this episode, U.S. policy in the Arctic has made a significant turn for the worse, lifting multiple bans on Arctic drilling and turning the U.S. into one of the biggest Arctic aggressors. I believe it might have been on the same voyage you had a survivor of environmental disasters. Yeah, Johanna is a climate survivor from the Philippines that lost her family to a typhoon, and that's how she became a climate activist. How many more lives would it take for powerful countries to realize that this is not worth it? Climate change is not only about numbers and statistics, but it's also about lives. It's not a question of if there will be an oil spill in the Arctic, it's a question of when. It's kind of to show that what happens if we lose, like if we're not able to stop the expansions into the Arctic. And it also makes very real, you're talking about how your lawsuit is based on concern for future generations that might be impacted with environmental disasters similar to that typhoon. That we don't need to just speculate about the future, it's actually going on every day in different parts of the world. What happens in the Arctic, what happens at Standing Rock, what happens on my ancestors' land, it's all connected. There is a majority in the parliament to open new areas for oil and there is a majority in the people to keep the oil in the ground. So the policy will change, the question is how fast it will and will it be soon enough.
John Iderola back Woo! from the, the frozen north. 